When we're dealing with bones, one of the things we want to understand is not only the name of the bone, but we also want to understand something called the bone markings. So what I've made for you here is a list of some terminology, and we want to understand kind of the terminology and what the names mean. And in the Bio 145 class, I will be actually testing you on the definitions of these on your lab practical midterm test. So let's first of all look at the chart and see how it's laid out. And notice first of all we have the names that we want to be learning here. We have their definitions here. We have an example of each of these over here. The first group of, of, of terms that we want to learn fall under a category that are projections that are sites of either muscle, which means they're attached to muscle by tendons, or ligament attachment. So first thing we know bones attached to muscles by tendons bones attached to bones by ligaments. All right, so these are projections that would either be having a, a ligament attached to it to attach it to another bone or having a tendon attached to it so a muscle could attach to it. Okay, the next projections we're going to look at are those that help form joints. Now, technically, a joint is where two bones come together, but in the context of this, it's where two movable bones come together. So... We actually have, um, we actually have our listing here of where bones are coming together and what type of connections would be there where the bones are coming together to form basically a movable joint. Okay, finally, we have some really important terms that will be used a lot, either depressions or openings to allow blood vessels or nerves to pass through. So uh, these group of terms are going to either be a depression or an opening, and they're going to allow, as it says, blood vessels or nerves to pass through at this point. Let's start with the first term, process. That is a term used an extreme amount of time for the names of certain parts of bones. And as we see here, it says any bony prominence projecting from the main bone. So all most bones have a, have a, um, a major portion of the bone, and then it will usually have something projecting off of it and can and keep in mind that these terms right here are things that are projecting off the main bone that would either have a tendon attached or a ligament attached to it. So processes is a very commonly used term in, uh, in a lot of uh, uh, structures that we'll be looking at on bones. So one example is something called a styloid process. We actually have styloid processes on several bones, but I'm just going to show you one. And it's basically, the styloid process is basically a sharp point or attachment site. So let me show you an example of that. Looking at this side view, if you'll notice this sharp point sticking out right here, and I'm going to show you another view of it from the individual bone, which is called the temporal bone. Notice that sharp point sticking out or that sharp point sticking out. Well, that is actually called a styloid process. But again, we have other sharp points that are called styloid processes. So we would specifically call this the styloid process of the temporal bone. And uh, you have styloid processes actually on your two lower arm bones that we may talk about later. Okay, next is called a tuberosity, which says large rounded projection may be roughened. Again, it's an attachment site, but instead of being a sharp pointed one like a styloid process, this is a large rounded area that is a connection site. And we have an example of the tibial tuberosity. Here we see the tibia and the fibula, but this area here is what we're talking about. It's kind of rounded and roughened. It's an attachment site. It lies below, right below your knee. You can probably feel it if you feel reach down on your leg. You can feel that little bump right below your knee on your upper uh, tibia area. That's the tibial tuberosity. Again, we have other tuberosities. Okay, the next term is crest. As it says, narrow ridge of bone, uh, usually prominent. And our term is intertrochanteric crest. So let's look at that. Now, this is one of those situations where two-dimensional is a little bit harder to tell than if we could actually see it on the bone, but I'll try to explain it. Okay, and notice intertrochanteric crest. This bump is a trochanter. This bump is a trochanter. So I have like a ledge between those, a crest. I can literally put my finger in that area. So it is three-dimensionally, has some depth to it. Okay, so that's the difference in a crest versus a line 
a line is not near as pronounced as a crest, so I couldn't put my finger in this line. I could feel the line, but I couldn't put my finger in it, but that crest can literally support my finger. Okay, next we find something that we only find on the femur. It's the trochanter. So when we had intertrochanteric, we we're saying this crest lies between two trochanters. So our example is the greater trochanter. And again, it's this very large, blunt, irregularly shaped process. So notice we're even using this term process, a protrusion off the main bone, to describe a specific process called the trochanter. Okay, here this big bump we call the greater trochanter. Further down, we have another big bump called the lesser trochanter. So again, these are only found on the femur, but they are very, you know, uh, large, irregularly shaped processes coming off the main bone. Okay, our next term is line. It's a narrow ridge. Notice that's also a narrow ridge, but this is prominent. This is a narrow ridge that is less prominent. So here we had an intertrochanteric crest. Here we had got an intertrochanteric line. So let's look and see what we mean by that. Okay, again, there's a trochanter. There's a trochanter. It might, on the back side of the bone, the posterior side of the bone, I have the crest. I could put my finger in there. But actually, on the front side of the bone, okay, so this is the anterior front side, I have a much less prominent feature between my two trochanters, which is a line. I could feel that, but I couldn't put my finger in it or rest my finger on it. I could just feel it. So it's much less prominent than the crest that we would see here. Our next term is tubercle, and it says it's a small rounded project projection or process and then we have the greater tubercle of the humerus. So normally if you see something that says greater, like we said, greater trochanter, greater tubercle, then there will normally be a lesser trochanter and a lesser tubercle. But let's look at the small rounded projection. It's actually very similar to a trochanter, but it's much smaller. And we would find it, instead of finding it on the femur, we would actually find it on the humerus. Okay, we're looking at the humerus this time not the femur, we're looking at the humerus. So notice, instead of having a trochanter, what I have is a tubercle, a greater tubercle, and then uh, further down, I would actually have a lesser tubercle. So again, I have the more rounded, much less uh, prominent process here, uh, the greater tubercle. I'm going to skip epicondyle right now because we need to know what a condyle is first so it will make sense. So let's skip down here to the spine. And I know when you hear spine, you probably think of backbone or, or you know, spinal column or something like that. But what we're talking about now is a sharp, slender, pointed projection that's on an individual bone. So here we're seeing something called the spine of the scapula. So when we, when we look at the scapula that you may know as your shoulder blades, Notice I've got this ridge coming off the back of the scapula. It's actually superficial. It's towards the body surface, but it is on the back side. This is called a spine. So again, a kind of a narrow, or, or it can be sharp, or it can be narrow, but uh, this spine is uh, what we're finding on the overall bone right here. Now, it doesn't include this portion, but it does include it running from here to here, the sharp, slender area coming off the off the body, and the body is normally what we call the major portion of most bones. Okay, we're going to come back to epicondyle, but notice our next heading is projections that help form joints. So all these terms we're going to look at right now would actually be terms that um, we would see where two bones come together and there would be movement. Let's go ahead and talk about this first one, so then we can go back and talk about epicondyle. And that is the condyle. It says a rounded articular projection. Now, to articulate means to come together with another bone. Okay, so here our example, and this, this, this one happens to be rounded. We have the medial condyle of the femur. All right, so let's look at an example of that. So when we look at the femur, notice we've got this rounded area where it is articulating with the bones that would fit below it, which would be the tibia and fibula. And the tibia in particular is what would fit against this. So this rounded area here, this rounded area here is a condyle. 
And again, it's where we are articulating with another bone. So that takes us back to the epicondyle. Now remember, it's an attachment site, not where it's articulating with the number bone, but it's the raised area on a condyle. And our example is lateral epicondyle. So what would that mean then? Well, I know if my condyle is down here, my condyle is down here, then my epicondyle would be on the side of the condyle. So epicondyle on the side of the condyle. If this is my medial condyle, because it's towards my midline of my body, then that means this is my medial epicondyle because it's on the side of the media condyle. It would be an attachment site for, for muscle. Okay, so back to our list. A head, as it says, is a bony expansion carried on a narrow neck. Well, most of us have a head sitting on our neck, so that should be pretty easy to understand. But where we find this in bones? Well, this is kind of like what when you hear the term ball and socket. This is the ball portion of the ball and socket joint. So looking at the head of the femur, notice this right here is the head. This is the head. And then, of course, the narrow area below it would be the neck. So this portion would be the ball of the ball and socket. And we would have a very similar thing in the humerus. It's just we wouldn't have as a pronounced, we have a neck, but not as pronounced a neck in the humerus. Okay, facet is a, a smooth, pretty flat surface that's articulating with another bone. So let's look at the superior processing facet of the vertebrae. Or vertebrae would join together one vertebrae to another. Notice this is one vertebrae here, so it has a superior articular facet and an inferior articular facet. So its interior articular facet is joining with the superior articular facet of the one below it. So again, that flat surface where it's joining with another bone, that gives our vertebrae a chance to kind of fit together and also protect our, our spinal cord uh, where the spinal cord runs through it. But again, what we're looking at right now is the actual facet or attachment site. Okay, we already did condyle, so let's move to ramus. This is an arm-like bar of a bone, the ramus of the mandible. This is kind of like, I like to imagine it kind of like a ram's horn, kind of has a curving up uh, off of the major bone, the body of the bone. So let's look at that. So this example is showing a mandible, your jawbone. Notice how if this is the main body of the bone, how I've got this area that curves up right through here. So if this is the body, notice again I've got this area that curves up off the body. Even though it has some actual processes coming off of it, this whole big area curving up off the body is the ramus. Okay, our next category are depressions and openings to allow blood vessels and nerves to pass. First thing you're going to see a lot of is foramen, which are holes that are going to allow either blood vessels or nerves to go into the bone or through the bone into the brain area. This hole right here is called the infraorbital. Infra means below, orbital means the eye sockets made up of several different bones coming together. So here again, we see another foramen right here, the mental foramen, which is on the mandible. So foramen is any holes. You can see the optic foramen back through here. Any holes that are in the skull or other parts of the bones that allow blood vessels or nerves to go into the bone. Okay, meatus is also a hole in the bone, but it is actually a hole that runs through through a passageway of bone, kind of like a, uh, a canal running through bone. Here we have the external acoustic meatus. So if you imagine this hole right here that basically is what you would stick a Q-tip in and your ear parts would be inside of there, so sound waves would also go in there, then that is a canal of bone, that a passageway of, of a hole within the bone that allows things to pass through. Okay, sinus, we've heard our, we know our sinuses get clogged or whatever, but what this actually is, is a cavity within a bone that is lined with the mucous membrane. So it's, it's filled with air and lined with the mucous membrane within a bone. Okay, a fossa, instead of being a hole like a foramen, is simply a depression. Usually something fits in the depression. They often occur where two bones come together. It's like a mandibular fossa. And then a fissure is a narrow slit-like opening so I'm going to show you examples of both of these. Look at this depression that's formed in here. So the, the what's called the condyloid process of the mandible can fit into this area here. So here you can see that depression, the mandibular fossa. 
And here you can see the infraorbital fissures that are in the back of the orbital of the eye.